the greatest of the last century, an astonishing 23 percent greater than the previous record set in 2005. A recent study by scientists at the National Center for Atmospheric Research projected that the Arctic Ocean could be devoid of ice by 2040. Furthermore, Dr. Jay Zwally, a leading NASA scientist, recently reanalyzed sea ice data and projected that the Arctic Ocean could be ice free in summertime as early as 2012, just four short years from now. The presence of Arctic sea ice is essential for many forms of animal and plant life, but particularly for the polar bear. Polar bears use these ice flows as a platform for nearly every aspect of their lives, including hunting their primary food source. The disappearance of sea ice as a result of global warming is leading to the very real possibility that polar bears will disappear as well. The Bush administration's own scientists project that the prospects for the polar bear's survival are bleak. Last year, Dr. Stephen Amstrup, who is with us today, headed up a team of scientists charged with examining the impacts of sea ice loss on polar bear populations. In a series of reports released last fall, Dr. Amstrup's team concluded that by mid-century, two-thirds of all the world's polar bears could disappear and that polar bears could be gone entirely from Alaska. Dr. Amstrup's team also noted that based on recent observations, this dire assessment could actually be conservative. The actions of the Bush administration in the coming months could very well determine the fate of this iconic animal. The Interior Department is currently considering whether to list the polar bear under the Endangered Species Act as a result of the impacts of global warming. Last week, the Fish and Wildlife Service announced that it was going to delay any decisions beyond its statutorily required deadline that legal protection for the polar bear would be put on ice while its critical habitat continues to melt. Meanwhile, the Interior Department is revving up its regulatory machine to allow new oil drilling in sensitive polar bear habitat. Earlier this month, the Minerals Management Service finalized its plans to move forward early next month with an oil and gas lease sale of nearly 30 million acres in the Chukchi uh, Sea, an area that is essential habitat for polar bears in the United States. The timing of these two decisions leaves the door open for the administration to give big oil the rights to this polar bear habitat the moment before the protections for the polar bear under the Endangered Species Act go into effect. Rushing to allow drifting, uh, drilling in polar bear habitat before protecting the bear would be the epitome of this administration's backward energy policy, a policy of drill first and ask questions later. In this situation, as in many things in life, order matters. You don't put on your shoes before your socks. You don't start driving before looking at a map. You don't buy your Patriot Super Bowl shirt before the game. But we shouldn't be selling the drilling rights in this important polar bear habitat before deciding how we are going to protect them. It seems that every time there is a choice between extraction and extinction in this administration, extraction wins. This must not be the case for the polar bear. Now I would like to turn and recognize the ranking member of the Select Committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner, for an opening statement. Well, first of all, Mr. Chairman, uh, what Patriots Super Bowl shirt? You are going to be wearing green and gold that day. <laughs> now I'll talk about the polar bear. <laughs> the polar bear is a majestic and fascinating creature that should be observed, admired, and protected, and its habitat is declining. The price of crude oil is reaching $100 a barrel, and the United States needs more and not less access to domestic oil and gas reserves. But I am afraid that this hearing of a select committee charged with examining the nexus of energy independence and global warming, the polar bear is simply becoming a political tool, and that is a shame. 
There have been some cynical speculation in the media and among some others that the polar bear is just a few decades from extinction and the current administration is ready and willing to diminish the polar bear's plight uh, in order to help the oil and gas industry. I believe nothing could be further from the truth. And it is my hope that this hearing can help address some of these misconceptions. Currently, the administration is looking at two decisions that, while interrelated, are decided under two separate, distinct and different laws that support two different policy goals, protection of the polar bear and progress on energy and security through the development of domestic oil and gas reserves. For more than a year, the Department of the Interior has been studying whether to list the polar bear as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. This is a complicated and nuanced question but one whose answer must be based solely, and I emphasize solely, on the best scientific and commercial information about the polar bear. If the scientists and wildlife managers at the Interior Department determine that the polar bear should be lit listed as a threatened species, then the United States should take all required steps under the Endangered Species Act to protect the polar bear. I note that regardless of whether the polar bear is listed under the Endangered Species Act, it is already protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. The Interior Department's Minerals Management Service has also decided to move forward with an oil and gas lease sale in Alaska's Chukchi Sea, which is a part of the polar bear's habitat. Should the polar bear be listed, then oil and gas companies will have to take all appropriate efforts to ensure that their exploration and production are done in a manner required by the Endangered Species Act. The timing of these separate decisions is incidental to protecting the polar bear. The hallmark of the Endangered Species Act is that listing decisions need to be based solely on sound scientific and commercial information and not politics. I worry that today's hearing will focus too much on the politics and not enough on the science. And that certainly isn't good news for either the polar bears or for America's energy security. I yield back the balance of my time. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There is a rare area of complete agreement with my distinguished friend from Wisconsin uh, as relates to the Super Bowl. Um, and I, I appreciate his <laughs> uh, elaboration. Um, I'm uh, very much appreciative of this hearing. I have a slight uh, difference of opinion with my good friend, Wisconsin, however, in terms of what the significance of this is. I don't think it's incidental. And just because they are tracking under different laws is no reason that they cannot be harmonized. Years ago, I was involved with an effort that struck a raw chord in this country as we were trying to rescue polar bears um, from a circus environment in Puerto Rico where they were being abused. It is fascinating to me to watch the, the outrage and the activity that this engendered. People could sort of understand that. And now I, I look back and I think of what is happening here today uh, because it is not just a, an individual circus in, in Puerto Rico, but we are talking about the federal government's action which actually might endanger and abuse not a handful of circus animals but threaten the existence of polar bears in the wild. This administration is dealing with activities that potentially threaten the habitat of this magnificent animal, which is a critical part of a spectacular but fragile ecosystem. It is stunning to think that the Federal Government, before considering whether or not this polar bear is endangered, would encroach upon almost half of its U.S. habitat. Now, I personally think that we are smart enough to figure out how to harmonize these efforts and make a difference. The notion that it is our country that wouldn't take that extra step uh, does give me pause. Um, and frankly, the notion that this is incidental, um, I think in the course of the hearing will be clear that it is not. We have an administration that has a record of taking uh, small steps uh, and driving forward. Uh, in effect, we are watching now throughout the western United States where sportsmen are finding that the consequence of the drill and dig and, as you were saying, Mr. Chairman, ask questions later. Uh, I think there is no excuse for not taking a few additional weeks and doing this right. I deeply appreciate your scheduling this hearing. 
The fact that I am not here for all of it is not a reflection on its importance, but we have Mr. Bernanke before the Budget Committee, and I am uh, obligated to be across the street. But I will be with you, I will be following up, and I do appreciate this. Thank, I thank the gentleman very much. Uh, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walton. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I look forward to uh, reading the testimony of the witnesses and hearing from them, so I will keep my remarks brief. We also have an Energy and Air Quality Subcommittee hearing with Chairman uh, Connaughton on his testimony in Bali uh, that starts in about 17 minutes, so I will have to depart for that as well. I know this is a serious issue, um, and I look forward to uh, hearing the scientific evidence involved here. I also know that uh, Consumers are, are getting a little tired of $4 gas or $3.15 gas, and uh, natural gas is certainly going up in price, which drives up fertilizer costs to the farmers I represent and drives industry offshore. And uh, I want to see America become energy independent, but in an environmentally sensitive way. So hopefully we can find a balance here that works for the country, for the polar bears, and for the consumers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Well, this we know. This is the last chance for the polar bear. They will never get another chance, and neither will we. And I was thinking about why people feel so strongly about this issue, and I was thinking about a woman named Helen Tayer, who was the first woman ever to ski alone to the North Pole. She was stalked for two days by a polar bear. She could have been an hors d'oeuvre for a polar bear. And I was thinking, why do we have such admiration, respect, and love for this species when they, at times, uh, can make us a snack? And I think there's an obvious and unobvious reason for that. The obvious reason is because they are so beautiful and magnificent, their ability to turn ultraviolet light into thermal energy, they're just beautiful. But I think there's a deeper reason that Americans feel so passionately about that, and that is that they realize that the polar bear is the largest canary in the largest coal mine in the world, and that it is not just the polar bear at risk from this threat of global warming, but we are at risk of the threat of global warming. And when people think, and I think the reason they care so much about this is they recognize that you don't cry for the bell tolling over the bear, we can, we can ask, why is the bell tolling for us? Because that's what's happening here. And people recognize that, that a polar bear without an ice cap is a fisherman without a boat, and that's tough on the polar bear. But a world without an ice cap is a world without a thermal regulator. If you can just hold up this poster here. This shows the sea ice in 2000, the ice cap, in the summer, and at the, at the latest, when it will disappear and be gone in 12, 2040. And the reason people care so much about the polar bear is they realize its demise is inextricably related with ours, because this is a thermal regulator for the, for the world's climate. And when we lose that ice cap, we lose a cap that radiates energy back into the Earth, and now the ocean starts to absorb six times more energy than the world did at its northern climes, which puts us at risk, not just the polar bear. So I am disturbed that this administration continues on a path of willful ignorance and habitual arrogance. It is willfully ignorant to go forward with allowing these leasing in this area immediately adjacent to the habitat, willfully ignoring science, willfully refusing to ask these questions before these decisions are made, and habitually being arrogant that oil surpasses all other forms of human value. So I hope that this hearing will convince the administration to rethink its position on this, ask the hard questions, get the scientific answers before we take this leap. And just on one party note, and this is kind of how I feel about this, if you look over these kids sitting over here, I don't know where they're from. All I know about them is that they're beautiful and they look smart as a tack. And what we're doing here today is basically saying when they're our age, they have polar bears around. And they should have an ice cap to make sure that their planet doesn't warm up. So these kids, I hope you enjoy it today, and I hope this administration is thinking about you when they make these decisions. Thank you. Great. Okay. The gentleman's um, time has expired. Um, the uh, chair recognizes the uh, gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for holding the hearing, and I want to thank our witnesses for taking their time to come and be with us today and share their information. Uh, we all know that the Department of Interior is currently considering a plan to list polar bears as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. And a basic question needs to be answered before we take such an action, and it's this. Are current polar bear populations sustainable? Are they even sustainable? This committee has called this hearing because some scientists think that they have the answers to this question. They say that the polar bear population is decreasing and global warming is causing the decline and that is going to lead to their extinction. However, could it be, could it be that their conclusions are based on speculative and hypothetical conjecture that relies on climate modeling methods that have been shown to be statistically inaccurate in predicting past and present climate change? Is that a possibility for us? To rely on these error-prone models to predict the survival of a species 40 or 50 years from now does not withstand the most basic scientific scrutiny. So we need to think about this one. And studies done by the World Wildlife Fund, Canadian biologist, and American climatologist are in direct contradiction to the claims of some of these scientists. These studies found that almost all, almost all of the Arctic populations of polar bears are either stable or increasing, and that changing wind patterns are the primary causes of changing sea ice distributions, not global warming. One of the most interesting findings in these studies is that data shows polar bear populations are increasing in warming areas and declining in cooling areas. Mr. Chairman, the most available and credible information on the status of the polar bear population indicates that listing the species as threatened could possibly be unwise and might be misguided. Instead, I think we need more studies to obtain precise and accurate measurements of population trends and ecosystem factors. The data could then be used to determine what best practices of conservation and management should be applied to maintain a sustainable polar bear population. I hope we will explore that issue and be able to arrive at some data that will give us better guidance. I yield the balance of my time. The right, gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson. Thank you, Chairman Markey. And uh, <clears throat> let me put my plug in immediately for the New England Patriots. And uh, I do think we'll be wearing the silver and blue in, uh, in celebrating. But uh, let me um, associate myself with the remarks of my uh, colleagues here. And specifically, I'm so pleased to see as well that uh, we have so many uh, young uh, people in the audience today, uh, because as Mr. Inslee has said, this is this is about you. It's about our planet. Um, I think of Teddy Roosevelt, that great, robust president who cared deeply about this country, its environment. I think of the bald eagle as our national symbol that almost was extinct. And today we have discussion over the issue of polar bears, who symbolically represent so much of the last vestige of the wild world in the North. And so I think it's important that kids are here today, because they not only get to hear the science and the facts, but they get to see their democracy in action, and they are stewards of the democracy of the future. And so you get to weigh the discussions and the arguments and the data and information that you hear from our experts, and then ultimately you get to decide as well. That's how our democracy works. It's interesting to see, I'm sure for you, that there are differences of, of opinion when it comes to preserving our environment and making sure that we give the appropriate status to endangered species like the polar bear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I must express some uh, resentment at uh, those of you uh, speaking about the Super Bowl. In fact, I, <laughs> I think we need to have some 
congressional hearings <laughs> just, uh, just because the Kansas City Chiefs lost the last nine games is no reason to prevent them from playing in the Super Bowl. <laughs> and I, I, and I, I, I just don't <laughs> think this is uh, democracy. <laughs> um, Having said that, the polar bears of the NFL. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, short statement, and, and I'm interested in the opinions of the uh, witnesses. Uh, the, the, the strange thing about all of this is, uh, even if we don't drill in, in Alaska, I think uh, most of the scientific community would agree that, the, that continuing to burn fossil fuel does, in fact, put more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And if there are more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the temperature of the Earth will rise. If the temperature of the Earth rises, the ice will melt. And, I, I, and so I think that uh, even if you don't want to accept this as a current problem, uh, just accepting the, the fact that fossil fuel creates greenhouse gas shows that there is a problem. And I guess the, the dot delight for me today is that uh, one of the polar bears came and, and they think that it's wrong to drill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, I also believe that uh, the polar bears are an iconic uh, species which may not uh, directly, uh, people may not think that it directly affects uh, human uh, existence, uh, but it's important to me and I think important to many of us and, and the children who are here today and uh, uh, those with imagination and appreciation and love for the nature that uh, the Creator left us in uh, position, or position of responsibility to protect and to guard, um, that species like the polar bear are allowed a chance uh, to continue to uh, have a habitat and to live, and that they are indeed uh, part of the fabric of the ecological net that we also are a part of, and that uh, one by one, as the species uh, that uh, are threatened today are removed by continued excessive consumption uh, and pollution, uh, that net becomes more and more fragile, um, and fragile to humans. Yesterday we had a meeting uh, about the Tappan Zee Bridge with some of us uh, representatives from New York and the uh, New York State Department of Transportation Commissioner, and I asked her, uh, among other things, because the bridge is being uh, probably going to be rebuilt because it's uh, deficient and uh, aging and because of the bridge collapse in Minnesota now everybody's thinking about other bridges that might be weak and need to be replaced. And I asked her, are they planning on building it higher because of the possibility of sea level increase because the Hudson River, which splits my district, is tidal all the way to Troy, which is north of Albany, New York. In other words, if the sea level increases, the Hudson River level will increase and that will affect things like the bridge, things like the rail, the freight rail line on the west shore of the Hudson and the passenger rail line on the east shore of the Hudson that are only a few feet above sea level now. And if we have a significant increase in sea level and more frequent and more strong uh, storms uh, as a result, that these things will have a direct impact on, uh, uh, on people living in my district and on the economic uh, life and investments that have already taken place in refurbishing waterfronts and building walkways and, and boardwalks and new restaurants and shops along these newly um, improved uh, downtown waterfronts. Now that might seem like a long cry, a far reach from a polar bear, but um, it's only one of the many ways that I believe that we need to connect um, what's going on. The changes, I mean, I'm looking at the difference here in the ice uh, in uh, one of our witnesses' testimony, the difference between the ice pack in September of 79 and the ice pack in September of 2007, and it's a significant reduction, and um, I, I just don't think that we can wait to make the change. The changes we need to make to save the polar bear 
are the same changes we need to make to stop asthma and emphysema from being such an epidemic in our inner cities and among our children, the same changes we need to make to save our balance of trade uh, deficit from being worse, the cha same changes we need to make to stop shipping billions of dollars to oil states and unstable parts of the world and borrowing the money from other countries, including China, to pay for it, are the same changes that, that are driving us into a loss of sovereignty and at the same time uh, destroying our environment. And so that is a lose, 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 lose energy policy. The policy that would change that and solve those problems is a win, 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 win policy in which we create new technologies, new industries, new jobs here in this country, keep our money at home, keep our children and uh, elderly from suffering the effects of asthma and emphysema, cut back on oil spills, acid rain uh, and, and other uh, detrimental effects of fossil fuel consumption. So uh, I'm, I'm here to hear the witnesses. I've used up all of my time ranting, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Great. The gentleman's uh, time has expired, and all time for opening statements from members has expired. So we'll turn to our panel and our first witness, uh, who is Mr. Dale Hall, who is the Director of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Mr. Hall has spent the majority of his life in public service over the course of Mr. Hall's three decades with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He has played an important role in developing our nation's fishery facilities. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you are ready, please begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ranking Member Sensenberger and members of the uh, Select Committee, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Mr. Chairman, I request that my uh, written statement be entered into the record. Without objection, it will be included in the record at the appropriate point. Thank you, sir. The service proposed to list the polar bear as threatened throughout its range on January 9, 2007, after a scientific review of the species found that populations may be threatened by the receding sea ice. Polar bears use sea ice as a platform for many activities essential to their life cycle, especially hunting for their main prey Arctic ring seals. At the time Secretary Kemp Thorne announced the proposal, he had directed us to work with the USGS, the public, and pertinent sectors of the scientific community to broaden our understanding of what factors affect the species, to gather additional information to inform the final decision on whether the species warrants federal protection under the ESA. To assist in that effort, we opened a three-month public comment period and held public hearings in Anchorage and Barrow, Alaska and Washington, D.C. In June 2007, we hosted a meeting that included official representatives from all of the countries within the polar bear's range. The meeting provided a forum for the exchange of scientific, management and technical information among the range nations. In September 2007, USGS scientists supplied new research to the service updating population information on polar bears in the southern Beaufort Sea of Alaska and provided new information on the status of two other polar bear populations. USGS studies provided additional data on Arctic climate and sea ice trends and projected effects to polar bear numbers throughout the species range. As a result of the new USGS research findings, we reopened and later extended a second comment period to allow the public time to review and respond to the USGS reports. We received numerous comments on the USGS reports and have been working to analyze and respond to the information provided during the extended comment period. We expect to provide a final recommendation to the Secretary and finalize a decision on the proposal to list the polar bear in the very near future. Part of today's hearing focuses on the possible oil and gas development activities occurring in polar bear habitat. As we noted in our January 9 proposed rule, the service determined that these activities do not threaten polar bears throughout all or a significant portion of their range after a review of factors including the mitigation measures required under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, historical information on development activities, lack of direct quantifiable impacts to habitat from these activities noted to date, the localized nature of development activities or possible events such as oil spills. In particular, the incidental take provisions of the Marine Mammal Protection Act ensure that any impacts on the species will be negligible and will not have an unmitigable adverse impact on the availability of the species for subsistence use by Alaska Natives. 
I look forward to working with you as we move forward in this process, and I look forward to working with all of the entities, uh, including the state of Alaska, other federal entities, the Congress, international community, and others, uh, as we work to conserve this very important species. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Hall, very much. Our uh, second witness is Mr. Randall Luthie. He is the Director of Minerals Management Service uh, in the Department of Interior. Uh, Mr. Luthi previously served as Speaker of the Wyoming House of Representatives. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the committee, uh, Ranking Member uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, it appears right now, as I've listened to the opening statements, what we all agree on is we're glad you had this hearing. Uh, it will be interesting as we go through and listen to the various opinions that are expressed today. Uh, I want to take an opportunity to let you know of our activities uh, dealing with the Chukchi Sea and the Alaskan Outer Continental Shelf. And from the very beginning, from the outset... C could you turn on your microphone? I'm not sure it's on. There, that might help. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry that all those witty comments were lost. <laughs> Uh, once again, let, let me state at the outset uh, that the, Marines man the, the MMS has worked closely with our sister agency, the Fish and Wildlife Service, throughout this process. This partnership is focused on protecting wildlife and the environment as we conduct an offshore energy program. We believe that energy resource development can be achieved consistent with these stewardship responsibilities. And believe me, we take those stewardship responsibilities seriously. The Department of the Interior and its agencies, including the Minerals Management Service, are public stewards of our nation's natural resources. We also play an extremely vital role in the domestic energy de development. One third of all energy produced in the United States comes from resources managed by the Department of the Interior, both onshore and offshore. Our national security, our economy, and our quality of life are dependent upon energy. Last week, we issued a record of decision to move forward on a, with an alternative energy development in the Outer Continental Shelf, which will help us as a nation expand our use of renewable energy resources. This represents an important milestone in charting a course designed to increase our energy security through the development of a variety of resources, and that is so important at this time in our lives. Can I have the first slide, slide, please, and you have it up. This just gives us an idea of what we're looking at. This is a slide from the EIA. Uh, you'll notice our U.S. consumption is ex of energy is expected to continue to increase. It appears that our U.S. production is also going to increase, but at a lower rate. What that means is we import energy. We import energy. Most of that energy is going to be oil and gas that we import. It's projected that we are going to see gasoline, an average gasoline price of $3.50 a gallon by this spring. It's unheard of a few years ago, but we now flirt with $100 a barrel oil. It is projected that our increase in our demand for energy will increase by 24% per, by year 2030. And during that same total period of time, as the chart indicates, our domestic energy will not significantly increase. Currently, the gap, as I mentioned, in this uh, import and our uh, demand are filled by energy imports. In 2006, we imported 10 million barrels of oil and nearly 11.5 million cubic feet of natural gas. It's predicted by 2030 an additional 1.9 million barrels of oil and 1.6 million cubic feet of gas per day is going to be above our current levels. Next slide, please. When we look at emerging economies, and this next slide takes a look at what the world consumption of energy is predicted to be. And once again, you know, we're used to the idea that when we needed imports, we could get them. I think we're, we're facing the possibility that that's going to be more and more difficult to do as you look at the great amount of energy the world is, asking, is, is looking at. We think it's important that as part of our energy resource portfolio that we continue to develop those natural resources. In fact, the EIA once again predicts no matter what we do in the next generation, the generation that we've talked about already this morning, we're going to rely largely upon the traditional forms of energy. That's coal, oil, and gas. It is my belief that we need to work with those resources as well as alternative resources to reduce our energy independence. 
Let's take a minute and look at the Chukchi Sea. Chukchi Sea Sale is one of four areas that we have included in our five-year leasing program. During 19, between 1988 and 99, there are 91, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. There were four lease sales in the Chukchi Sea area. 483 blocks were leased. Five exploration wells were drilled. And all of those wells indicated the presence of some oil and gas. We estimate that this area is, contains approximately 15 barrels, billion barrels of oil and 76 cubic, uh, trillion cubic feet of gas. This process, as we go through a sale, includes consultations and conferences with the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service under the Endangered Species Act, as well as the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Both of those agencies issued no jeopardy biological opinions. These reviews looked at the potential direct, the indirect, and the cumulative effects of the lease sale on marine mammals including polar bears, as well as subsistence activities. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to use your analogy, we believe that we have put on our underwear first, our T-shirt, our socks, our shirt, our pants, and then our shoes, and lastly, the belt. We think we've done a good job in making sure we understand the potential effects of this sale. If you would go back to the last slide, please. That gives you an idea of some of the things we have done on this slide. We may be able to go back to the last slide. One of the, what the slide indicates there, if you'll look at that, uh, the, that's the, uh, of course, the, go, the coast of Alaska. That narrow white line is the, uh, the state land, submerged lands. Uh, the next blue line was the area originally included in the sale proposal. Uh, as well as that pink. What we did after consultations with the Fish and Wildlife Service as well as the native groups, we reduced the size of the sail back to the green line. So that means at least 25 to 50 miles offshore, which is important critical habitat for beluga whales, for bowhead whales, for migratory uh, birds, as well as the polar bear. In addition, uh, that area that is shaded there would indicate that if any leases were uh, leased in that area, they would have additional restrictions regarding exploration and development in order to protect natural resources. MMS has an important role in providing information. In the last 30 years, we have provided nearly $300 million of funding to study natural resources in the offshore of Alaska, including the polar bear. Um, Mr. Chairman, I see that uh, my, my statement goes on much longer than the stoplight does. And uh, again, having been somewhat in your seat at a smaller level, I understand the importance of trying to move this along. I would ask, however, that my full written state be included in the uh, uh, record. I look forward to uh, attempting to answer questions that the committee might have. Uh, I thank you, uh, Mr. Luthi, and your um, entire statement will be included uh, in the record. We thank you. Um, we also uh, have with us and sitting at the uh, table Dr. Stephen Amstrup, who is the polar bear team leader uh, for the United States Geological uh, Service. Um, he is not going to deliver an opening statement, but he will be here to answer questions from uh, any uh, member of the uh, select committee. Uh, he is a renowned wildlife biologist uh, with the USGS. Uh, uh, at the Alaska Science Center and one of the world's preeminent uh, polar bear uh, experts. So we thank you for being here as well, uh, Dr. Amstrup. So uh, the chair will now recognize himself uh, for a round of questions. And let me begin with you, um, Director Hall. Uh, can you assure the committee that, and the public that science and only science is and will control the final listing decision for the polar bear. Yes, sir. Director Hall and Director Luthi, will the final polar bear listing decision be made and be effective before the scheduled February 6th Chukchi lease sale? S since that time frame is in, uh, is in my lap, uh, I'll respond to it. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, you know, last week I, I held a press conference and announced that uh, we were going to have to take some extra time. And uh, that responsibility is mine. I, I don't like to do that. I don't like to miss due dates. 
but I want to make sure that uh, when we roll out a, a package to the public in the Federal Register, that it clearly demonstrates the well thought out uh, process that we went through and how and why we reached the conclusion that we reached. It was mentioned earlier that, uh, that there are uncertainties uh, uh, in, in science. Uh, and frankly, that's the nature of science. And if we, um, if we moved forward expecting to have a decision that didn't have uncertainties with it, we'd never make a decision. Uh, that's the world we live in. In natural resource management, we're constantly predicting what might happen in the future, but not just what might. What do we expect? What, what do the best data lead us to believe? And in uh, taking this extra time, I wanted to make sure that our staff and I uh, had enough time to clearly understand, be able to explain uh, both the reasons why we accepted uh, information that we accepted and relied upon and the reasons why we didn't. I appreciate that, uh, Director Hall, but uh, we do need assurances that the public uh, listing decision will be made before the lease sale. And so there is a, a real problem here, uh, and we have to do something about it. So uh, I am going to introduce legislation later today with members of this committee that will ensure that the Interior Department makes these two decisions in the correct order. My legislation will require that final listing and critical habitat designation decisions for the polar bear be made before the Chukchi lease sale can take place. This will not prevent the Chukchi Sea leasing, but um, simply require that the Interior Department, the two of you sitting here, um, make the decisions in the proper order to protect the polar bear. It's one agency. You have one secretary who runs your agency. Uh, and this decision-making process should occur in the proper sequence. Uh, and uh, we, I'm going to introduce legislation uh, to make sure that uh, that is the way in which it happens. Dr. Amstrup, could you tell us, in your opinion, how endangered is the uh, polar bear? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, our research completed this past summer uh, contributed to a body of, of information that already existed on polar bears. Uh, that research suggested that uh, within the next uh, 50 years or so, that uh, population of polar bears could decline by approximately two-thirds because of changes in the sea ice habitat that are related to uh, uh, global warming. And uh, these results were based on a variety of uh, modeling efforts uh, based on uh, outputs from general circulation models and outputs from population dynamic models. And our best assessment at synthesize, or our best attempt to synthesize all of those into a comprehensive uh, forecast of what the future for polar bears might be. I, I thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Amstra, very much. And I thank you for your work as well. Um, this is an important moment for Secretary uh, Kempthorne. He must do the right thing. He must ensure that uh, Mr. Hall makes his decision before Mr. Luthi makes his decision. He must make sure that the polar bear has the proper uh, legal protection before Mr. Luthi makes his decision as to where and how drilling will take place for oil and natural gas. We don't want to either lose uh, a polar bear or our potential for more oil and gas in this country. But we have to do both in a way that is sensitive to the role that each plays in our society. And uh, Secretary Kempthorne has a big historical moment that he is going to be um, uh, presented with. Uh, and we are going to do everything that we can uh, in order to ensure that the public understands how critical that decision is. Let me turn now and recognize the gentleman uh, from the state of Wisconsin, uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a technical question for Dr. Amstrup. What has been the trend in the polar bear uh, population since 1972? Do we have more of them, less of them, same number? 
Thank you, Congressman. Th that's a good question because it's one that has come up repeatedly in the press and uh, in the public. Uh, historically, uh, our knowledge about polar bears goes back to about the, the mid-1960s, and it was at that time that people who were interested in Arctic wildlife realized that polar bears pretty much worldwide were being harvested extensively. We had uh, aerial trophy hunting that was occurring in Alaska. Uh, there was shipborne trophy hunting that was occurring in uh, uh, north of Norway. Uh, they were using set guns uh, on the uh, uh, Svalbard archipelago to uh, uh, kill polar bears, basically a trap kind of a situation to get the furs. And populations were recognized as being very low at that time frame. Uh, just how low they were wasn't clear because nobody had been doing detailed okay, well, studies. My time is limited. So, so when, 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 did the, when did the hunting protections of polar bears kick in? What year was that? 1972 is when the Marine Mammal Protection Act kicked okay, in. Okay, so the Marine Mammal Protection Act, at least within the United States, uh, stopped the, uh, the, the type of hunting that you were describing that occurred in the 60s. Now, what has happened to the polar bear population since the Marine Mammal Protection Act uh, became effective? Has it gone up? Our research has shown that the populations have increased substantially, not only in Alaska, but in many other parts of their range, okay. up into that's, the, the mid-90s or so. That's the that I was looking for. Now, Mr. Luthi, uh, did I hear you correctly when you testified that the proposed lease in the Chukchi Sea, uh, there had been an examination of the impact on the polar bear habitat, and the result was that uh, if the exploration and the drilling occurred, that there would be a negligible impact on the polar bear attitude. Did I hear you correctly when you said that? That is correct, and that was also, I believe, a statement by Director Hall. Mm -hmm. Under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, we're also required to confer with the wildlife agencies, and that's actually one of the uh, stricter acts uh, that's available, and, is, uh, and, and we have, must mm -hmm. comply with that as well. Well, after hearing you, Dr. Amstrup, and having uh, heard the result of your study, Mr. Luthi, let me say that the fears that I expressed in my opening statement, I guess, are coming to fruition. Uh, it seems that the scientific evidence that Dr. Amstrup has referred to and the study that Mr. Luthi has done in the course of, of, of the discharge of his duties uh, indicate that while there is perhaps a problem with polar bear uh, population, uh, going ahead with the lease will not have a major impact on uh, the habitat of the polar bears in this part uh, of the sea across Alaska. You know, if that's the case, uh, then I don't think Mr. Markey's bill uh, has the scientific uh, background. Uh, that is necessary to affect what he wants to do and that, that this process is going along uh, fairly well even though it is a two-track process under the existing law that has been passed by this Congress. So what's the beef? And I yield back the balance of my time. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. I just want to comment on some of the things said in our opening statement about the problem that we face, people suggesting that there is no clear science about what is happening in the Arctic. And it is unbelievable to me people are still adopting the attitude of the ostrich in this situation. One million square miles of the Arctic disappeared this summer. That is the size of six Californias. Disappeared, stunning the scientific community that knows that probably about 40 percent of the depth of the Arctic has been gone AWOL in the last couple of decades. And people who refuse to ignore this plain visual evidence, I don't know how we are going to solve our problems as a country if they refuse to recognize this visual evidence. It is not hypothetical. It is not theoretical. It is gone. I just want to make that comment. Um, I want to ask uh, Mr. Ludi about the risk of of uh, oil spills with polar bears. Um, some people suggest it is essentially no risk, but I am reading from the environmental impact statement of May 2007, 
and it says, we estimate the chance of a large spill greater than or equal to 1,000 uh, um, BBL occurring and entering offshore waters is within a range of 33 to 51 percent. For purposes of analysis, we model one large spill of either uh, 1,500 BBL platform spill or 4,600 BBL pipeline spill. If a large spill were to occur, the analysis identifies potentially significant impacts to bowhead whales, polar bears, essential fish habitat, marine and coastal birds, subsistence hunting and archaeological sites. Is that the conclusion of the environmental impact statement? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Representative Inslee. Uh, I believe you may be reading from our in environmental impact statement. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, an environmental impact statement, as you well are aware, is, is, is asked us to basically evaluate all kinds of impacts. I don't think we would be doing our job effectively if we didn't realize and, and say that we're going to look at the possibility of a spill whenever there is development. The history shows us differently. Uh, the reality is, particularly in the Alaska area, industry has been very careful and we require that they be responsible for also having cleanup equipment available. And, but we do have to. In, we do want to say that there is the potential to spill. To be I otherwise that. would be. Uh, I appreciate that, and that's why we'd like to have the science before you make this decision. If I told you there is a 33 to 51 percent chance of you being run over by a bus in the next year, I think you would think that was significant, and you would want to know that before you made decisions. You have concluded there is a 33 to 51 percent chance of a spill, which, in your own words. And I'll quote from your own agency, final environmental impact statement says, and I quote, our overall finding is that due to the magnitude of potential mortality as a result of a large oil spill, the proposed action would likely result in significant impacts to polar bears if a large spill occurred, close quote. Despite that own finding of your own agency, nonetheless, you have decided, unless something changes, to go ahead with the lease of these extreme number of acres, despite the fact there is that substantial risk, knowing that the other part of the agency is about to enter or could enter an endangered or threatened species declaration. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Inslee, you have quoted the, the uh, EIS certainly accurately, and I would point out to you the word if a large spill occurs. The purpose of an impact statement is to evaluate those potentials. We then are left with the agency some discretion of how to overcome and mitigate that potential impact, which we have. Now, in addition, you mentioned the second part of your uh, uh, statement uh, deals with, you know, before the Endangered Species Act kicks in or if it does. Frankly, we go, as I have said in my opening statement, we have worked with the Fish and Wildlife Service very carefully about consultation not only with the polar bear but also all marine mammals. Uh, we believe that adequate protections exist should the Fish and Wildlife Service list the I understand the you believe that, but I will tell you what, my constituents do not believe that. We think my constituents believe, the 650,000 people I believe, that you are acting in willful ignorance of known science by making this decision before the taxpayer money is used adequately to evaluate this science. And when your own agency recognizes this threat, it is, I believe, negligent in the extreme to make this decision without having the declaration made by the other, other agency. One other question. I sense from your testimony and reading your testimony and what the agency has said that it treats a declaration of endangered or threatened species as sort of a nullity. It is kind of no big deal. We would kind of do the same thing whether or not there is a, a designation. And I find that totally uh, uh, disrespectful of the law and, and I, I can't understand how you take that position. Tell us what would be different about your leasing decision if there had been a designation before your leasing decision. Okay. If I understood your question correctly, it would be what would change if the polar bear had been listed be as we went through the sale process. Is that correct? Uh, what would be different would be one more layer of consultation, and it would be official consultation under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, that, however, and, and let me underline however, what I believe uh, you are not pointing out particularly is the protections under the current Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which in many senses is actually more strict. What the consultation would result in is, well, we don't know what it would result in, but what the purpose would be is to make sure that any of the activities that we authorize do not jeopardize the existence of the whatever creature or critter is happens to be listed. 
gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Walton. Chairman. I want to continue to pursue this line of questioning. Uh, Mr. Luthi, I, I had written down this question. What happens if you uh, go ahead with the leases and then the polar bears are listed? But tell me practically what happens. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, Representative Walden, thank you for that question. Uh, should the polar bear be listed? Uh, again, what that does is, is add an additional uh, a layer of consultation. The leasing process is actually a very phased process. The sale of the leases is only the first. The second step comes in when the company develops an exploration plan. That plan has to be approved by us. It has to be reviewed by the Fish and Wildlife Service Agency. Uh, it also has to be consistent with uh, basically the state plans as well. So that would be probably the first time that additional layer of consultation would take place. Is when they actually had a development plan. That would occur again should they have a production plan and probably at least one more time in the process before the oil or gas should actually flow. Do you have other uh, threatened or endangered species listed where you have leases? Uh, yes, we pardon me. In the Arctic? Uh, uh, we do. We, uh, uh, we have the specta the eiders is, are listed uh, as well as I, I, I think one of the whale species. Is that correct, Dale? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And you can you? With us, huh? Yeah. And, and, yeah, and, and actually, the, that would be on the, uh, the whales we consult with the National Marine Fisheries Service. And can you tell me the historic uh, activities that have occurred after those leases have been let and mm -hmm. the species have been listed? Have you seen spills? Have you seen uh, uh, threats to these species? Have you seen loss of life? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Representative Walden, I'm pleased to tell you that in the limited exploration that, and development that has happened in the uh, current Outer Continental Shelf of Alaska, we have seen uh, no blowouts, only very small spills, and these are spills that are normally contained with, uh, uh, they're more diesel and the preparation as opposed to actual crude oil, and we have not had, uh, to my knowledge, there has not been a take or harassment of the endangered species. Now talk to me a bit about, uh, you mentioned in response to Mr. Inslee's question, um, but you didn't get into any detail, that you would have to overcome and mitigate if there were a spill. I mean, your, your environmental planning process says, here's the range of options, right? Here's the worst thing that could happen. And then don't you go to the next step and say, and here's how we would mitigate to make sure that didn't happen? So I'm, I'm concerned, Mr. Inslee's saying you have a 33 to 50 percent chance of a, is it a thousand barrel spill? I, I believe that is what he quoted. And is that your worst case scenario mm -hmm. under the EIS? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Walden, uh, I, I believe it is, but what I would also like to do, Mr. Chairman, if, if you would give, grant me the opportunity, uh, I brought back up. Uh, uh, John Gohl is our regional director in Alaska okay. and has worked uh, personally on the EIS far longer than I have. And, and if, if you would want more technical running, answers. So, yeah, I would. Mr. Chairman, if that's okay. I, I have no problem. The gentleman has a minute. Yes. Uh, my my clock. Left to go with, I, if, I've uh, got about two minutes if, left, so make it quick. If the gentleman could come up to the table, uh, identify himself for the record, and then answer the question from the gentleman. Sir, uh, my name is John. And we'll extend the gentleman an extra minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. My name is John Gall. I'm the regional director with the Minerals Management Services office in uh, Anchorage, Alaska. And with regard to, we review basically two types of information when we evaluate a sale. One is what we reasonably expect, that is, activity that we know will happen, the, you know, the activity in the water and such. And under the, for example, when an operator goes under there in Alaska, they have gotten uh, authorization from either the National Marine Fisheries Service or the Fish and yeah. Wildlife Service for the Marine Mammal Protection Act authorization. So the, that is where the protection comes in. The companies do apply for that and they are required then under those acts uh, to follow certain requirements. With, we also evaluate though, again for disclosure, that if there were a spill, what might happen. So we look at uh, the various kinds of scenarios and that is what I think we, what you're asking with regard to. But then the I, I also understood you have uh, then mitigation to overcome that. Is that right? Well, or proposals our, to overcome and then what you would do if it Actually, happens. the is expectation that? from the sale from an expected value right. is that we expect no significant spills. Okay, that was our so conclusion. I, I'm going to run out of time here. I want to go back to this issue that, that there's an anticipation of a 33 to 50 percent likelihood of a thousand barrel spill if these leases are led. Is that accurate? That is what our statistics show. 
And, and do you have no way to mitigate or permit No, that? there is mitigation. The, okay, get to the that. last offshore spill from a platform was in 1980. Uh, spills generally occur, if they do occur, through at the development stage, and we have had a very good record since. There is many redundancies with regard to the drilling programs, and the technology today is much better. The statistics we have used go back in time, so you are including a lot of uh, past records. So in the 33 to 50 percent chance of a spill of 1,000 barrels, this, this does not reflect modern technology we, Our goal is to prevent any spill from occurring, and with our regulatory system, uh, what I am saying is that we have been very successful in that in the last two decades or so. Since 1980, almost Cor three decades then. Correct. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for your courtesy in extending the additional time. I appreciate the witnesses. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, let me uh, continue with this uh, line of questioning because I think it is in informative. Mr. Markey has made a, a proposal that seems to me, just on the face of it, to be logical and pragmatic. <clears throat> Mr. Hall, Mr. Luthi, would you object to the legislation as passed, or do you think that that is sound uh, policy and practice? Well, it is probably a, a a question that I can't answer because I don't make the decision for the administration on what they support or don't don't support uh, that comes uh, through the statement of administration. Well, position. let me ask you personally. Personally, uh, the the activities it, what what uh, Director Luthi has been saying is true. Uh, we don't have any substantial records that the oil and gas exploration have created an issue for the polar bear. And yet Mr. Inslee uh, in his questioning says that by your own statement you recognize that should a catastrophe occur, there is a risk here of 33 to 50 percent, which we said, you both said earlier, this would be, have negligible impact. Does it not make sense to follow what Mr. Markey has laid out so that we can, or is it because you don't want to encounter the consultation that you will have to go through? Uh, that surrounds uh, uh, making the polar bear an endangered species. What's what's the big deal here? I don't I don't understand why. What's what's behind this? Why wouldn't you proceed in the order that Mr. Markey has suggested? We we will proceed. And quite frankly, if it uh, if 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 I hadn't made the decision that I made to give us more time, it would have worked that way anyway. Uh, and, and I apologize uh, for doing that, but I just felt like we had to to give our staff the opportunity. Um, but, but quite frankly, uh, you know, I'm a biologist that happens to be sitting in a position that, uh, uh, that is, is political and uh, has uh, that ramification, and I'm never quite comfortable in telling anybody what kind of laws they should pass. Well, listen, I thank the both of you for your, for your public service, uh, and th these are difficult decisions. But they are very important uh, decisions for the, for the country and in this case for uh, uh, not only the polar bear but as you have uh, acknowledged in your own comments, other mammal life as well. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Armstrong, could you uh, uh, answer the question, uh, given the record low uh, summer sea ice this year, what are uh, you doing to uh, understand the impact on, uh, on polar bears? And what could you tell us about the future impact of global warming and this melting uh, with regard to that? Well, let me try and answer the second question first. Uh, the, uh, um, the work that we have done has suggested that uh, the changes in the sea ice uh, that are projected to occur and have already been observed to occur are having a negative impact on polar bears across uh, uh, different reaches of their range. Uh, and uh, we expect that those negative impacts will continue. What we are planning to do about them uh, is uh, in terms of understanding what our projections, uh, how accurate our projections are and uh, uh, whether or not we need to adjust our projections in the future, is we do plan to continue the monitoring that we have been doing for years. Uh, we are trying to get work done in the Chukchi Sea, which we don't have much recent research uh, ongoing in the, or haven't had re recent research ongoing in the Chukchi Sea. Uh, we do plan to continue the uh, research in the Beaufort Sea, where we have got a long-term data set. 
and uh, we're hopeful that that will continue to refine uh, our understanding of the impacts. What would a spill in the, uh, as they've indicated the, with the, in their own assessment here, what would that mean with respect to the polar bear? We don't really have any data that would address what the effects of a spill of that size might be in that environment. Uh, we did do an analysis of uh, uh, oil spill in the Beaufort Sea on an offshore uh, proposal that was, uh, uh, that was made some years ago. And uh, what our research showed there is that uh, spills that escaped the shoreline, that is when the oil moved offshore, uh, there was a, uh, a substantial risk of a large number of bears uh, encountering the oil. Um, in the Chukchi Sea, the situation is very different than it was in the Beaufort Sea, and it would require additional work like that to get quantitative information on what those risks might be. With regard uh, to the risks of polar bears if they encounter oil, uh, the data that are available are few, but pretty clear. The polar bears do not do well when they get into oil. Uh, they tend to groom themselves, they ingest the oil, and uh, the uh, spills tend to have a uh, they basically, uh, they most likely are fatal. Now, Mr. Luthi, would you, uh, in the question I asked Mr. Hall before, just as a quick follow-up, uh, do you think that Mr. Markey's proposal is a common sense, pragmatic uh, uh, course that we should take? Um, what's the big deal here? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, appreciate the question. Uh, again, I haven't seen the proposal. I would have to read it in detail. Uh, however, uh, as I would say again, uh, we wouldn't be proceeding with this sale if we weren't comfortable that we had enough knowledge, enough data to say that we can adequately see that the polar bear is protected as well as other endangered species. If and let me underline if, if the department makes a decision uh, to list the polar bear. Uh, we take it respond, we, I'm very serious about seeing that we do this right. And I believe we are doing it right. Uh, it's an interesting, we talk a lot about data and science and, and the information that's out there. And one of the reasons the data that has been collected so far is in anticipation of sales. That's one of the reasons that we actually start spending money to try and get more and more data about the Chukchi Sea, about natural resources. So it's actually a help, and to some degree, in it with our scientific knowledge. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I apologize for my late arrival. I'm fighting a bad cold. Um, Mr. Hall, um, can you give me a broad description of the implications of trying to make a decision to list a species as uh, endangered or threatened in the context of global warming? Well, it's, um, this has been uh, the, one of the most difficult processes that we've gone through because it is atypical. Um, normally, we, the 1,300 species that we have on the list, uh, We've seen wetlands uh, developed. We know what's ex you know exactly the the point sources of where we're losing them, all the different aspects associated with it. Uh, we have po uh, better population estimates in a lot of cases. Uh, uh, so it's in, in the case of global warming, where it, the the impacts are coming literally from everywhere. Uh, it's it's been pretty difficult. However. Um, the, the responsibility to answer the questions brings it back into scope that we can deal with. Because the questions uh, under the Endangered Species Act still deal with the habitat for the species, the impacts that may occur to the species, and those, we call it the, the five-factor analysis. And that's the process then that we have gone through with the help of USGS and the other scientists out there to understand. Um, not necessarily all of the different sources uh, and where they're coming from, uh, what, maybe even what country they're coming from, but for the purposes of, of the listing on the Endangered Species Act, it's what's happening uh, to the habitat that is the question that we're answering. Would any, any of the other of you like to comment on that? I don't think I can add anything to the procedural aspects. If there's a particular question, uh, I'd be uh, attempt to try it in, as, re as involved with the Chuck GC or the sale process. Um, Mr. Hall, uh, is there the potential that someone could, uh, on the 
on the basis that the sea was rising, alleged that a that some uh, country was an island country could allege that the species on their habitat was threatened as a result of what is happening and uh, try to uh, affect any decision you make based on a remote effect. And you said, depending on the country it's coming from, uh, effects uh, very remote from where, for example, you are looking out. I'm sorry, uh, I'm, I'm not exactly Let sure I understand what you're way. asking. Um, let's say a company in my state of Arizona uh, decided it wanted to build a coal-fired power plant. Um, uh, would they be required to consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service to ensure that their actions wouldn't affect polar bears in the Chuck oh, okay. Chuck GC? Um, they would be uh, anyone uh, that is proposing an activity uh, uh, that uh, that could impact a listed species. Uh, if it has any kind of federal connection, would require a Section 7 consultation and under coal fired plant and uh, uh, energy or whomever uh, would have to consult. The question would then be uh, do we have the science, do we have the technology, do we have the capability of making the linkage uh, to take? because uh, the Endangered Species Act is pretty specific in what we have to establish, and the courts have made sure that we understood that. Unfortunately, we've lost some cases where the courts felt like we were being speculative in coming up with uh, TAKE. The Arizona Cattle Growers Association case at the Ninth Circuit upheld uh, told us that we were wrong, that we couldn't speculate, that we had to have a direct cause leading to TAKE before we could say that TAKE was occurring and that uh, the, the, the attorneys that uh, have really uh, interpreted that to mean the but for clause. But for this action, would this take have occurred? And the burden is on us and the science to be able to make that very direct linkage uh, to the take and to the diminishment of uh, the population of the species. Uh, because the Endangered Species Act listing is for the species. Habitat is a measurement of damage or, or, uh, or positive impacts, if we can improve it, to the species. But the Act has us analyze take and then leading to jeopardy or no jeopardy. And the science as it is today, even the IPCC information, uh, would not allow us to, to segment out that this particular set of emissions caused this particular set of impacts leading to take. That's the, the difficulty with this. I think the answer to my question is, and my time's out, if, if the allegation was that those emissions could cause that effect, if they could answer the but for test, the answer to my question would be yes. Yes, they, they would have to consult uh, if, if they believe that they, that they may contribute to the effects. But then the next question is, is it likely to adversely affect? And that's really the part that I was answering there that would be extremely difficult to deal with. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. The chair <laughs> recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hall. Mr. Luther, first, um, are you familiar with the USS Arizona? Uh, to some degree, yes, sir, sir. Went down Pearl Harbor. Yes. Uh, one of, uh, I think, nine ships that went down uh, in the attack. Um, have you ever gone there in Pearl Harbor to to, uh, to see uh, the ship, which is on the bottom, but but mm -hmm. there's been a a um, an area where people can walk over and actually look down in the water and see the remains. Unfortunately, I have not been able to see that personally, Mr. Uh, Congressman Cleaver. Each day, uh, when when uh, thousands of people go over, it's it's actually the number one tourist attraction in Hawaii. Oddly, oil is bubbling up out of the Arizona every single day, 60 years later. Sixty years later, you can see it on the water. I mean, it's just laying on the water, and, and, and you can see it bubbling. It, it is amazing uh, that uh, it's continuing this long. And so, I, I watched. I, I watched it uh, last week, and and and, uh, and realized uh, the lasting uh, impact on oil spills, uh, and and what it does uh, to the to the environment and to the uh, 
uh, animals and species that, that are, are impacted. I, I'm also wondering, uh, this is a difficult question, I hope it's fair. Um, do you think that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Life Service um, is strictly dealing with uh, uh, fish and wildlife or does it get into ideological issues as it looks at fish and wildlife issues? Any, any of you? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Cleaver, uh, this is one I think I really should defer to Mr. Hall as Director of the Fish and Wildlife Service. Well, uh, um, I'm going to try and interpret your question. Uh, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll say it again if you okay. didn't understand it. I, I usually don't like for people to interpret what okay, I say. Okay, good. I, 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 that's why I was so, going to say what I thought you said. Okay, so you well, you, <laughs> it, 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 what, what part didn't you understand? The, the philosophical part. No, ideological. Ideological, okay. Is it ideological or scientific? Is your decision ideological or scientific, or is it a mix of, of, of two? Hmm. But, um, over my 29 years with the Fish and Wildlife Service, I think I can speak with some confidence that our employees uh, approach work from number one, trying to be a professional, and number two, trying to be honest about what we know and don't know. And as I spoke earlier, in all of science, there's a lot we don't know, but we have to deal with it. But um, as far as being uh, ideological, uh, I believe the vast majority of our employees, and, and I, I'm one of those, believes that we should be advocates for truth, whatever that is. And if the truth means that there is an impact, we need to say that. And if the truth means there isn't, we need to say that. Um, because I think the public depends upon us to be as honest in our disclosures as we possibly can be. I appreciate that. If that's the ideology you're talking about, then. Well, y yes, c quite not, okay. not completely. But uh, I mean, when, when we began to discuss this issue, global warming, uh, endangered species, quite often we get into an ideological discussion uh, that has to do with uh, uh, you know, free commerce and, and uh, uh, government uh, intervention into business and, and that kind of thing. Um, and so there, there, there's a whole bit of, of resistance to the acceptance of the science based on ideology and not science. So, but, but dealing with the whole issue of, of, of receiving the facts and dealing with them honestly, is there any doubt in your mind at this point that the uh, habitat of the polar bear uh, has been damaged? Oh, I think, uh, I think there's a, a, a difference between has been. Uh, we certainly lost 20 percent. But the decision that we're trying to make and, and will make will be over the foreseeable future, which actually would take us out to mid-century as well. And we know, based upon the science, that the habitat is leaving us. So uh, there is no doubt that that is happening. So what is the problem? There is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've tried to say this, and, I'll, and perhaps I'm not being clear. It's not just making the decision that's important. It's making it clear and why, because we had over 600,000 uh, comments come in, and there were people that didn't agree that, that the issue you've described is there. There are people that believe that it was. Our responsibility is to answer for everyone that when we have uncertainty, that we accept, because we accept some risk in everything, know, but that we explain that. But, you, but you, you've already but stated. But I want to get to the, uh, the, 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 when I release a document with my signature, mm -hmm. I, want you, it, I want me. it to be clear. My time is running out. But you've already said that you agreed with me that the habitat uh, has been damaged. Mm -hmm. I, I, didn't you say that? I, I, I think that's factual record, that we've lost 20 percent of the ice, uh, I believe it's 20 percent since the 70s. Uh, roughly, a little more than that. I, I think that's that's scientific. Okay. Uh, so how, how much do we need to? How much should do you think we need to lose 
before uh, we say this is an this is a clear problem. You said that you wanted to make sure everything was clear. That this is a clear problem because twenty percent looks clear to me. I mean, if I if I had a hundred dollars okay. and lost twenty percent. I clearly lost $20. Uh, oh, okay. I'm, uh, maybe uh, I might owe you an apology. I thought you were talking about the listing decision versus a decision that we need to do something about climate change. We need to do something about climate change starting yesterday. Yes. And it needs to be a serious effort to try and control greenhouse gases, which is probably the only thing we actually can control. If the earth is tilting, if other things are happening, we can't control that. But we need to look at those things we can. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Armstrong, um, when the ranking member uh, asked you a question about uh, bear population, uh, he cut you off when you were still talking. I was curious if you were going to say anything further about recent years of uh, population. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Congressman. That, uh, I was going to add a couple of comments. Um, so the, the trend from the time that the uh, overexploitation was recognized in the late 60s and early 70s was a period of growth in many uh, areas of the polar bears range. And unfortunately, we don't have data from all areas of the polar bears distribution. But to the extent that we have data, it suggested a period of population growth. But that was in a period of stable environment, stable sea ice. and. Uh, it has changed in recent years. We have seen the loss of ice that Congressman Cleaver was just referring to. And um, uh, it is projected to continue to decline at a rapid rate. And in fact, the declines are, that are predicted uh, actually haven't uh, been as fast as what we have actually observed. So it is clear that we are losing an increasing amount of polar bear habitat. The habitat losses in a couple of areas have already been shown to have negative effects on polar bear populations. So do we know, can we quantify this or do we just know that as we lose habitat, therefore, we must be losing population? Uh, it has been quantified in uh, uh, Hudson Bay, in the western Hudson Bay population. We have seen significant declines in survival and a 22 percent loss in population size. Okay, thanks. That's, that's, I'm sorry. I, yes. just, I only have five minutes, so I okay. just want to get to a couple other things. And thank you for uh, filling in some more of your answer. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Luthi and, and, and Mr. Uh, Hall, I guess Mr. Luthi first, uh, you know, your charts and slides about consumption projecting uh, this uh, 20 percent, 24 percent demand increase by 2030. Uh, in my district, we have held, uh, I have held, my office has held hearings around the 19th District of New York. On, uh, on solar energy and on biofuels and on uh, uh, efficient, uh, high, high efficiency building techniques and uh, on hydrokinetic tidal power, which is being tested in the East River. And my constituents are coming out in overflow crowds to find out what they can do, to ask what they can do. And a lot of them are doing something, uh, as I am, you know, buying wind power every month uh, in my home, burning 20 percent biodiesel in my home, heating oil, uh, driving a hybrid vehicle, et cetera. Uh, and we just passed a substantial, it is not a perfect energy bill, but it's, it does some things. It puts billions of new dollars into renewables and into uh, uh, conservation and carbon sequestration. And, uh, um, and we are trying to lead, uh, as I think the United States should try to lead, uh, as instead of following uh, the world in developing these new technologies. And, there are regional uh, uh, cap and trade systems being set up in the Northeast and in the, in the Western states, as well as, of course, the European Union and other, other uh, parts of the world. My question is whether your projection of the increase and your statement that no matter what we do, I think uh, this is a quote, if I remember, we will primarily rely upon coal, coal oil, and natural gas uh, in this projected time. Uh, are you saying that taking into account all these efforts that are being made on renewables and conservation? Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Hall, uh, that slide comes from the Energy Information Agency, and that is what they are saying, that even with the increased emphasis on renewables, which I support absolutely. Uh, one of the reasons uh, I am so thrilled to be director of MMS is that we are starting an alternative energy program and offshore. Uh, but that is what that slide says. That is what they tell us, that no matter what we do, it is not going to move fast enough to make a significant decrease for at least the next generation of coal, oil okay. and gas. Uh, excuse me, but I, I just want to get through a couple more questions before it goes red. Uh, 
You are aware, I am sure, that California's electricity demand has been flat for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. It has gone up and down a little bit. It has basically been flat, even as the rest of the country has been on an increasing curve. Uh, and that is because we presume of the regulation, uh, the regulatory climate in California being stricter, Air Resources Board and other regulations that uh, they have adapted to. And California is not a developing uh, nation with no high technology. They have big screen TVs and video games and lots of industry. And, and so it seems to me that there are examples that we can look at to show that energy consumption can, can be limited without limiting our, our way of life. And our productivity. So, I just I don't understand. Here's where you get into the question. I think that uh, Congressman Cleaver was mentioning about ideology. I, you know, you can draw a graph that projects. I, I have seen graphs that project different outcomes depending on what policies this government adopts and and uh, what, what lifestyle. You know, do we choose to fight literally and give billions of our dollars and the lives of our uh, men and women in uniform to take oil from un unstable parts of the world or from dangerous and difficult areas like the Arctic uh, uh, and the uh, Chukchi uh, Sea, uh, or do we look for uh, these uh, alternatives that are not as dangerous but do require us to develop new technologies? And I, uh, let me just ask you as a follow-up because I know my time <laughs> did just run out. I'm curious. Uh, the least total in your testimony, your written testimony for the Chuck Ch 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 C leases, total $500 million. I'm curious what the potential value of the oil and gas underneath those leases is, if you've estimated that. Um, Thank you. And I'll have uh, Director uh, or Regional Director John Hall deal with that technical question because uh, I think we do have a value. I know we, we have a value on the amount. Uh, the issue is until you inventory and we really find out what is there, we don't know. Our scenario in the EIS said that it would take a, at least a field of a billion barrels to be able to produce. If you multiplied one billion by a hundred dollar oil, you're talking a hundred billion dollars. If you know on at today's market, which everybody expects will go up, some people yes. So you're talking about a potential hundred billion dollar yield for, for, for a fee at one field, for a, correct? For a, a lease of five hundred million dollars. Well, we don't know what we would be getting from the sale with regard to the bids. We don't know that until the sale happens. Well, some some of us believe that these offshore leases and leases on public lands have been given away too cheaply to the oil companies. Um, do you, is there any possibility that that's happened here? Or uh, we were let me answer that one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Hall. Uh, the Minerals Management Service takes very seriously its responsibility about getting a fair market value for leases. Uh, I, I would invite you to come to our offices and see how we conduct our, our sales, particularly in the Gulf of Mexico, where we have some more experience as well. After a lease sale is offered, we actually go through a process once we, the bids are in and we evaluate whether that truly is a fair market. And there have been times we have turned those leases back. Thank you, sir. I'll, I will take you up and thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Gentlemen's, Yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, this is a very, very, very important subject. And uh, uh, I think this panel does deserve a, a second round of uh, questions. And, uh, uh, and the chair will recognize himself for that purpose. Dr. Amstrup, uh, what would the impact of an oil spill be on uh, the polar bear. You are America's leading expert on the polar bear. What is your judgment as to the impact of, of an oil spill on uh, their habitat? The, uh, the impact of an oil spill on polar bears would depend on the size of the spill, the currents, the winds uh, that, that would distribute the oil after the spill. Uh, all of those things would have to be taken into account. Uh, and we don't have data on those things. But what we do have data on is that uh, the uh, effect of oil on polar bears is in a, a wild environment where they don't have access to uh, strong medical veterinary care uh, is likely to be fatal. So, uh, so it could the, be a disaster. If a number of polar bears were affected, they would probably die. And, and to the extent that that number is large, it could be it could be a big problem. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Amstrup, very much. Um, Mr. Hall, would you mind if Secretary Kempthorne made a decision which um, 
postpone the decision on the leasing of uh, of the Chukchi um, leases until you made your decision? It, it wouldn't impact what I'm doing at all. So it'd be his decision, and, and uh, whatever he wants to, to, to do is, is fine with me. Uh, Mr. Luthi, would you mind if Secretary Kempthorne made a decision um, that uh, guaranteed that Mr. Hall's decision uh, Mr. Preced, Chairman, preceded the decision which you mm -hmm. uh, are tasked with making. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, as I've stated, I'm confident that we have done all we needed to no, do. No, I didn't ask you that question. I asked, would you mind, would you object if Secretary Kempthorne uh, decided to allow Mr. Hall to make his mm -hmm. decision first before you announced your decision? Mr. Chairman, certainly the Secretary is my boss. That would be his decision. That would be his decision. Uh, and, uh, and so you would accept that? Yes, sir, if he should do so. Okay. If new information were available and he should make such a decision? Well, there is new information available, and that is that Mr. Hall uh, is not going to be able to make his decision uh, unless something happens uh, that once again uh, keeps the order in place that had been decided upon, which is that Mr. Hall would decide first on the polar bear. Uh, and the protections needed for the polar bear. Uh, Mr. Hall mentioned earlier uh, that he was somewhat uncomfortable as a biologist trying to make a political decision. Uh, but the problem is just the opposite. We have political players uh, confronting a scientific decision, and the chief decision maker is the Secretary of the Interior, Mr. Kempthorne, who could turn this upside down decision right side up. Uh, in a nanosecond, if he wanted to. All he has to do is say, let's use common sense. Uh, let us ensure that we understand that extinction is forever. And we must make that decision first before we send the oil and gas industry out into the critical habitat to break up the polar bear ice. Uh, so while I appreciate the testimony that both of you have presented to us today. In the end, if this is not fixed, it is Mr. Kempthorne who is to blame. Uh, I hope he understands the importance of his decision. I fear he does not, because this is now a looming threat uh, that has not been dealt with by the uh, Department of Interior. Uh, in the end, man can adapt, but the bear cannot. Uh, we can act to prevent global warming, but the bear cannot. We can develop alternatives to oil. The bear cannot. When the ice is gone, man cheers about new commercial opportunities for oil and grass, gra uh, gas drilling. The bear starves and <coughs> drowns. Uh, I have been hoping for common sense from the Department of Interior and from Secretary Kempthorne, uh, but I have heard that all too common abandonment of common sense here today. We are going to have to redouble our efforts on this committee and in this Congress uh, to head off the uh, extinction of the polar bear. Uh, if this decision is delayed in making uh, a determination as to drilling in the Chukchi Sea, this still, we will still be years from the first barrel of oil ever coming from the ocean. But if we get this sequence wrong in terms of the protection of the polar bear, uh, we will be accelerating the day when the polar bear will be extinct. And I do not think uh, that that is something that the American people want to see. So I thank both of you for being here today. And I call upon Secretary Kempthorne uh, to make a decision that once again <coughs> lets Mr. Hall make his decision before Mr. Luthi, you make your decision. The ball is now in his court. Let me now turn and recognize the gentleman from Washington State, uh, Mr. Inslee. The, uh, the more I listen to this, the more I understand that this is a case of the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing before they act. It could result in a suicide squeeze play for the polar bear. And, and this is a big deal. I have come from the Seattle area where Dr. Cecilia Bitz is, who has predicted the demise of the ice cap, where George Devoshi is, who has been studying the Arctic for 25 years now and is starting for the first time to see starved polar bears wash up on the beaches that he's been studying for 25 years, where he's seen 
very significant changes in migratory bird habits. So it is a big deal in the country I come from. And uh, I want to I want to focus on the fact that this left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing is very important. It is clear, isn't it, uh, Mr. Luthi, that if, if you do this leasing and then there is a designation of a status by the agency, uh, it will be too late for you to do what the agency may want you to do. Isn't that right? Mr. Chairman, Representative Inslee, uh, uh, taking some liberty with what you mean, should we go ahead with the leasing sale and, and offer the leases for sale and some are purchased, then the, then the decision is made by the Department on the status of the bear. What uh, we have lost something is what I believe you are indicating, correct? Yeah, we have lost the ability to do what the Federal Government is charged by the taxpayers to do, which is to protect the polar bear. Now, if they make the designation before this, they might compel you to reduce the sale by 10 percent, for instance, and you could reduce the sale by 10 percent geographically. But after you issue these re re leases and then there is a designation and then the agency says, wait, we have got to reduce this by 10 percent to, to, to have an acceptable risk to the bear, then isn't it true that it is too late for you to go back and terminate the leases? Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Inslee, I disagree, one, with the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. I'm not asking doing. you about you don't like my metaphors. And we will, uh, Excuse me. I want you to answer my question. You may not like my metaphors, but I want to answer my question. If they designate the bear and you have already uh, issued the leases, you cannot terminate the leases legally, can you? We cannot terminate the leases, but Thank we are you. able to consult on the next stage, which is actual the uh, But I want to make clear, I want to make absolutely facility. clear so that you understand. If you go forward on the course you are at and you issue these releases, leases and then the Federal agency that is vested with the legal authority to protect the bear says that those leases will endanger the bear at an unacceptable level to the taxpayer, you will have lost the ability to stop that activity. Isn't that correct? Yes or no? I think that is a yes or no answer. I will not answer yes or no because it is an incomplete answer. Well, you will certainly have lost the ability to prevent drilling in certain areas. Isn't that correct? We have not lost the ability to protect the bear under the Marine Mammal Protection Act at this time. Well, you know, you're, I, I know you don't like the answer to this question, but I think you answered it. Once you issue the leases, it is too late to go back and terminate them. You will not have the ability to, bring, to take back the leases that the other Federal agency have told you that have been, would have been unduly dangerous to the bear. Isn't that correct? Correct. Thank you. We have you. the ability to condition those leases, however, to protect the bear under the Endangered Species Act. Thank you. Species I think you have answered my question. Now, the other thing that was a little soft soap in this 33 to 51 percent chance, I want to make sure I understand this. I want to read you the paragraph on page E7, excuse me, ES4 of your document. Over the life of the hypothetical development and production that could follow from the lease sale, other effects are possible from events such as a large accidental oil spill or natural gas release. We estimate the chance of a large spill greater than or equal to 1,000 BBL occurring and entering offshore waters is within a range of 33-51 percent. That is a direct quote. Now, I have heard some suggest, well, no, that is really not considering all the whiz-bang technology we have. But I can't believe that an agency of the Federal Government would issue this document and say there is a 33 to 51 per chance, cent chance of a mortal oil spill, not taking into consideration existing technology, not taking into consideration existing geolog geological information, not taking into consideration existing information to bear. And Mr. Luthi, it is true, isn't it, that your agency reached a conclusion that there is a 33 to 51 percent, percent chance of these type of spills considering existing technology? I will ask Mr. Gall to respond. He seems to uh, want to be able to tackle this one. Thank you. We update the statistics with regard to the probability on a periodic basis, and then that rolls in new technology. So. The data there again reflected what the past history has been. I, I, I'm sorry, but I got This should be really, really simple. You okay. use the best information about the technology you have that's available to you when you reach this estimate. Isn't that correct? You didn't just ignore what you knew, did you? We used the best available Thank information you. at the time. Correct. 
gentleman's time has expired. Do other members uh, seek recognition for the purpose of asking questions? I don't see any members who do. We thank you um, all for testifying today. Um, this is the beginning of what I think is going to be one of the most historic environmental decisions in our country's history. And, uh, uh, and this committee intends on uh, being a part of that process from this moment forward. Thank you. Thank you, so Mr. Much. Chairman. Thank you. Our, um, uh, we have a very distinguished uh, second panel uh, as well, uh, and uh, we uh, will ask uh, each of them uh, to come up to the uh, table. Um, uh, Ms. Cassie Siegel uh, is the uh, director of uh, <coughs> climate, air, and uh, energy program for the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, she is um, uh, uh, focusing her work uh, on the protection of heat trapping pollution and protection of plants and animals threatened by global warming. She is one of the leading experts on the polar bear and the Endangered Spe Species Act. Um, we welcome you, uh, Ms. Siegel. Uh, whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify, and thank you so much for your leadership on energy independence and global warming. I have some slides which I think will come up in a moment, and as you know, the polar bear is completely dependent on sea ice for all of its essential behaviors, including travel and mating and hunting its primary prey of ice-dependent seals. Polar bears can't hunt seals from land, and so tied to the ice are they that some other polar bears even give birth to their cubs in snow dens, like this one, which we'll see if we can advance the slides. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> advance, please, just to there. Thank you. The future of the polar bear in a rapidly warming Arctic is grim. <clears throat> Next slide. Polar bears are drowning. Next slide. Resorting to cannibalism when they don't have access to their usual food sources and starving. Next slide, please. This photo was taken in September 2007 in northern Quebec, Canada. This bear is in the final stages of starvation. And while we can't say for sure that this bear died as a direct result of global warming, we know that global warming is and will continue to increase the number of bears that suffer this fate. But we also know that it's not too late to do something about it. And that's why the Center for Biological Diversity submitted the petition to list the polar bear in February 2005. The listing process has already benefited this species by raising awareness of its plight and leading to new information which we would not otherwise have had. Most importantly, the USGS completed a study on the future status of polar bears. Next slide. To do this, they divided the world's polar bear populations into four ecological regions shown here, and they modeled the future population size of polar bears based on the IPCC's a1B scenario, often called the business as usual emission scenario. The results of the USGS study are profoundly disturbing. Under business as usual emissions, polar bears will be completely gone from the divergent ice ecoregion shown here in the purple and the seasonal ice ecoregion shown here in the green by 2050. The good news is that polar bears may hang on a bit longer here in the convergent ice ecoregion in blue and the archipelago region in orange. But the risk of extinction by the end of the century in these areas is still unacceptably large, over 75 percent in the blue area and over 40 percent in the orange area. Most disturbingly, the USGS study may underestimate the risk to polar bears. This is because the Arctic ice is melting faster than forecast by any of the world's leading climate models. Next slide, please. You've seen the Arctic ice pack in September 1979. Next slide, and again in 2007. This next slide, please, shows graphically actual observed minimum sea ice extent in the heavy red line compared to model projections in the dashed colored lines. Next slide, please. Yes, it's good. You can see that not one single model projected the record new minimum low sea ice extent in 2007, and further that there was less ice in the Arctic this past year than more than half of the models project for 2050. 
The situation in the Arctic has reached a critical threshold, but there is still time to save the polar bear if we act immediately. And a critically important first step is to list the polar bear under the Endangered Species Act. Next slide. Our nation's strongest and most successful law has a critically important role to play in saving this species. And we also need to rapidly reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, including, of course, carbon dioxide, but also other pollutants, including methane and black carbon, that have shorter atmospheric lifetimes but very high warming impact in the Arctic. And we also need to protect the Arctic and the species most at risk from further direct impacts such as oil and gas activities and the oil spills that come with them. But right now the opposite is happening and the only thing that is keeping pace with the melting of the sea ice is the breakneck speed with which the Department of Interior is rushing to approve new oil and gas development in polar bear habitat. And now the Fish and Wildlife Service has illegally delayed the polar bear listing as well. It has been over three years since we submitted the petition to list the polar bear, and we've already had to go to court once. The polar bear shouldn't have to wait any longer. While there are many reasons the Chukchi lease sale 193 should not proceed, at a minimum, this sale and other oil and gas activities in polar bear habitat should not go forward until the polar bear is listed, until its critical habitat is designated, until a recovery plan is in place, and then only if these agencies can affirmatively demonstrate that these activities would truly be compatible with polar bear conservation. Chukchi Sale 193 cannot possibly meet this standard, and therefore it must be stopped. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Ms. Siegel, very much. Our second witness, um, <clears throat> Deborah Williams, is the president of the Alaska Conservation uh, Solutions. Uh, she has devoted uh, 25 years to conservation and sustainable community issues in uh, Alaska. Uh, and for her work, uh, Ms. Williams received a presidential appointment as special assistant to the Secretary of Interior for Alaska. Uh, we thank you, and uh, whenever you're ready, please begin. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, polar bears are indeed on thin ice. Thank you so much for holding this critical hearing to help focus the nation's attention on the very serious plight of our country's polar bears, whose survival is jeopardized by global warming and proposed offshore lease sales. Polar bears are bellwethers for the nation and the world. Their fate reflects our fate. The good news is that there is still time to act, but unquestionably the time to act is now. There are three actions that we can and must take to protect polar bears. All of these actions will be beneficial to our nation's future. First, as has been well described, we must postpone the Chukchi lease sale until adequate information regarding polar bears and other key species is available. And certainly, we cannot hold this lease sale until polar bears are listed under the Endangered Species Act and their critical habitat designated. Secondly, we must provide critically needed funding for polar bear research and management especially for the Chukchi population. And third, we must, of course, pass comprehensive legislation substantially reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide. Alaska has warmed at a rate four times faster than the rest of the world, as shown in that previous slide. <laughs> there we go. Oh, no. Oh, we're having fun. Previous? Previous? There we go, um, as shown in red. And in fact, the Arctic Ocean is the warmest ever recorded in some locations, five degrees centigrade above normal. Next slide. Sea ice has reduced dramatically in Arctic waters, especially committee members. You can see where the Chukchi Sea is. That is where the dramatic reduction has occurred. As Dr. Stephen Amstrup has stated, our results have demonstrated that as the sea ice goes, so goes the polar bear. Next slide. As evidenced by cannibalism, and these are slides of the brutal, bloody fingerprints of global warming as it relates to polar bears. As evidenced by cannibalism, starvation, drownings, decreased cub survival, small skull size, and more, the evidence is compelling. Alaska polar bears are suffering from the effects of global warming right now. Given the above, does it make sense to add a substantial additional risk to the survival of polar bears from the Chukchi lease sale that is scheduled to take place in less than a month? Absolutely not. The sale must be postponed. Next slide. The Chukchi is an amazing part of our national heritage and home to the Chukchi bearing population of polar bears. 
Overall, this extraordinary sea nourishes humans and a myriad of other very valuable species. This slide shows the vast extent of the proposed Chukchi lease sale, which is in red, and how it overlaps with the American managed population of the Chukchi polar bears. Stunning. Almost all of the critical polar bear denning, uh, rather, locational sites is covered by this Chukchi lease sale. Now, three critical points. We do not know enough about the Chukchi Sea population of polar bears or the biology of the Chukchi Sea to make an informed decision about this sale. We simply do not know how many polar bears there are in the Chukchi Sea. We don't know where they're distributed. Every federal agency admits one of the following, that a reliable population estimate for the Chukchi Bering Sea currently does not exist, quote unquote, that existing population estimates, quote, are to be considered of little value for management, unquote, and that the population, quote, is already declining. In addition to polar bears, numerous valuable species of whales, walruses, seals, birds, and fish exist in the Chukchi Sea. But this next slide is what I think, and the next slide, is one of the most important statements made by a federal agency. And that is looking at the Chukchi area as a whole. The National Marine Fisheries Service has said, quote, the information necessary to properly assess the biological effects of sale 193 is not available. Close quote. Congress would never make a decision with this little information. It is irresponsible. This kind of ignorance is not bliss to polar bears or the other denizens of the Chukchi, especially when this ignorance is serving as the basis for proceeding with a very risky le um, lease sale. Next slide. We do, however, know that there have been major impacts from oil development in Alaska. For example, there is an average of over 500 spills from the North Slope oil industry each year. And as the Exxon Valdez oil spill underscores, human error can cause massive, devastating oil spill damage. Oil spills are a particularly serious problem for the Chukchi, as Dr. Steve Amstrep stated repeatedly. Oil kills polar bears and is particularly impossible to clear and clean up oil when it's in broken ice, and that's what the Chukchi has. This is a lethal combination for polar bears. Next slide. As has been repeatedly stated, there is a 31, 33 to 51 percent chance, or an average of 40 percent chance, of an oil spill. So bottom line, what does this mean? As you have stated, Mr. Chairman, even MMS says that Quote, due to the magnitude of potential mortality as a result of an oil spill, cell 193 could result in significant adverse impacts to polar bears. As special assistant, I supported several oil and gas lease sales, but I do not support leasing the Chukchi at this time. It is irresponsible. And Mr. Chairman, there are better alternatives. Next slide. That wind farm is a Kotzebue, which borders the Chukchi Sea. We have tremendous renewable energy in this area. Next slide. Before closing, I do want to emphasize the need for Congress to fund necessary research and management efforts for the protection of the Chukchi and our nation's other population of polar bears. And of course, the final comment is, first and foremost, in addition to these actions, we must dramatically reduce our emissions. Last statement. We are a compassionate country filled with innovation, and renewable energy resources. We do not need to write a death sentence for polar bears from premature, ill-advised offshore leasing and recklessly high emissions of greenhouse gases. We can do better. And for the sake of polar bears, ourselves, and future generations, we must. Thank, I, we thank you so much, Ms. Williams. Um, and uh, our final witness is Ms. Jamie Rappaport-Clark, uh, the Executive Vice uh, President of Defenders of wildlife. Uh, she has spent 20 years in government service, primarily with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Service, uh, where she served as director from 1997 to 2001. We thank you so much for being here. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the Select Committee. Thank you for um, inviting me to testify today. This hearing today highlights the conflicted and misguided priorities of this current administration. On the one hand, the Bush administration continues to drag its feet on protecting polar bears under the Endangered Species Act. 
On the other hand, it's rushing forward with its proposal to sell oil and gas leases on nearly 30 million acres in the Chukchi Sea in the heart of critically important polar bear habitat. At the very least, this creates an appearance of once again allowing politics to trump science and endangered species decision making. As the chair mentioned, uh, as a longtime career biologist with the federal government before becoming director of the Fish and Wildlife Service, I know firsthand the challenges faced by the dedicated professionals implementing the Endangered Species Act, and consequently, I am certainly reluctant to criticize them. However, I cannot ignore what this administration's political appointees have done to the administration of the ESA and our other conservation laws. This administration has repeatedly engaged in political manipulation of science and conservation. The Interior Department's own Inspector General exposed cases of inappropriate political interference with the professional assessments and recommendations of the Department's biologists, scientists, and wildlife managers in endangered species listings and critical habitat determinations, decisions which the Department has now been forced to revisit at a significant cost to taxpayers. Thus, when the administration delays listing while at the same time promoting new oil and gas leasing in critical polar bear habitat, it is reasonable, I believe, to suspect that it is once again putting political interests before conservation. There are numerous factors that support listing polar bears under the Endangered Species Act. Above all known threats, however, is the unequivocal loss of polar bear habitat due to global warming. The polar bear's Arctic sea ice is literally melting away, as my colleagues uh, just demonstrated. Interior's own scientists have concluded that if we continue business as usual, there will be no wild polar bears left in the United States by 2050. Clearly, there is no scientific rationale for further delay. Polar bears should be listed immediately. Once the Interior Department proposed to list polar bears, the Minerals Management Service and Fish and Wildlife Service were obligated by law to determine whether oil and gas leasing in the Chukchi Sea is likely to jeopardize polar bears, and if so, to confer on the leasing and its impacts. After polar bears are listed, uh, the agencies must consult under the ESA to ensure that the listing is not likely to jeopardize their continued existence. It would fly in the face of the precautionary approach to the Endangered Species Act if the Interior Department were able to take advantage of its own delay, its own delay, in making a listing decision in order to expedite oil and gas leasing in the Chukchi Sea without fully evaluating the potential harm to polar bears. At a minimum, the administration should delay any leasing in the Chukchi or any other polar bear habitat until the listing decision has been made and consultation requirements are fully met. The potential harm for, to polar bears from oil and gas leasing in the Chukchi Sea is substantial. Such development is highly risky and detrimental to polar bears and other Arctic wildlife. And most disturbing, there is no technology uh, to respond to and clean up spilled oil at sea uh, in conditions that are prevalent in the Arctic. Uh, the impact of promoting additional burning of fossil fuels will add further pressure to an already stressed polar bear population. We cannot continue business as usual. The plight of the polar bears is a warning to all of us that we need to act now to reduce our use of fossil fuels. In conclusion, the polar bear should, uh, the Bush administration, for the polar bear, the Bush administration should move forward immediately to list the polar bear and to fully comply with the Endangered Species Act. The administration should also withdraw the proposed oil and gas leases in the Chukchi Sea and should refrain from any further leasing in polar bear habitat until adequate measures are in place to protect the polar bears and their habitat from the harmful effects of such development. Most importantly, the administration should stop their foot dragging and work with the Congress to develop an energy policy that will reduce our use of fossil fuels and our production of greenhouse gas pollution. If we act now, there is hope for the polar bears, the Arctic ecosystem, for ourselves and our children. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify, and I am happy to respond to questions. Thank you, Ms. Clark, very much. We thank each one of you. The Chair recognizes himself for a round of questions. Uh, Ms. Clark, um, you support <coughs> delaying the decision on the leasing in the Chukchi Sea until there is a decision made on the listing of the polar bear. Absolutely, uh, Mr. Chairman. It just makes common sense. Now, when you had the job of running 
the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, would you have made a recommendation to the Secretary of Interior to make that decision? Unequivocally, and yes. You would have. <laughs> and would it be appropriate for you to make a recommendation to the Secretary? Yes. Uh, and, and so Secretary Babbitt did welcome those kind of recommendations? Yes, he did. Okay, great. Thank you. That's very helpful to me because, again, Secretary Kempthorne obviously has a huge decision uh, to make here. And he, does he have it within his power to rectify this uh, problem? Uh, yes, he does, Mr. Chairman. On the one hand, uh, he has a, an obvious statutory responsibility to make a decision based on the best science available uh, whether or not the polar bear deserves the protection of the Endangered Species Act. On the other hand, he has a somewhat discretionary decision on timing of oil and gas leasing in the Chukchi. Uh, very different decisions. But decisions within his Both power. within his purview, absolutely. Okay, well, that's, I think that's important for the public to know. Yes. Um, uh, Ms. Williams, you, you are uh, uh, testifying to the fact that there are still gaps of knowledge uh, that exist in it terms is of the interaction between a uh, what is going on uh, in the um, uh, ice melt and its impact on uh, polar bears. Could you expand on that? Yes. The gaps in knowledge represent a virtual black hole. And as I mentioned, we don't know how many polar bears are there are there. We don't know their condition. We don't know their distribution. We don't know how the recent melting, which you saw so dramatic in this area, is affecting them. We do not know, other than we believe from previous research that spill would be lethal, but we don't know the precise you know, traveling of that spill and so forth. And so we do know, though, that we have no technology to clean up oil in broken ice that has been proven. We do know it's lethal. And so what we know all speaks in favor very much of your um, legislation. What we don't know also speaks in favor of your legislation. I, I, thank you, uh, Ms. Williams. And uh, Ms. Siegel, you, uh, uh, you heard what uh, Ms. Clark and Ms. Williams said both about the decision that Secretary Kempthorne can make uh, and the gaps in knowledge that exist. Would you like to expand upon either one of those uh, thoughts? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe that there's many reasons that Chuck Chi Lee sale 193 should not go forward, but the fact that the polar bear has not yet been listed and that the uh, process has now dragged on for nearly three years when it is supposed to be completed within two years is reason enough to halt this sale. Um, I, I think that's absolutely all we really have to know that there's a year delay already in protection of the, um, the polar bear. But no time can be lost in the leasing of oil and uh, gas drilling in the area where the polar bear lives and uh, has to have a habitat if it is to survive. So that's the equation, and we have to ensure uh, that the Secretary of Interior makes the right decision mm -hmm. or the Congress makes it for him. Yes. Uh, Mr. Mark, if, if I could um, add, I, I think, I mean, in listening to the testimony, one of the most significant um, uh, revelations as I was listening uh, to it um, relates to what the decision is that has to be made. The decision by the secretary and the director uh, regarding the polar bear uh, needs to be made based on the best scientific information available. They seem to be trying to solve the cause of endangerment before making the call that it's endangered. Um, the Endangered Species Act does not call for that. It calls for a decision to be made on the biological status of the species at this time um, and um, uh, all of the kind of initiatives, innovations, uh, other um, um, opportunities governing recovery will take over after that. But they're not going to solve the problem without declaring it. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Scott. That's very helpful. And, and I, I think I will include that in my uh, in, in, in the, the language which I um, uh, use to accompany the legislation okay. as I'm introducing. I think that's very helpful. Um, uh, my time has ex expired. Let me now turn and recognize the uh, gentleman from Missouri. Uh, the, uh, the gentleman is the, the last 
um, questioner, I believe, unless another, mem another member returns. So I'm going to recognize the gentleman uh, and ask him then to adjourn the hearing, if he would, uh, or if another member arrives, to please give the gavel to him. So with that, I recognize the gentleman from Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it does not uh, happen often that I am in full agreement with our uh, witnesses, uh, but but I am today. Uh, but I, I, because I didn't get clear answers uh, with the previous uh, panel, uh, I'm, I'm interested, Ms. Clark, if you could give us a picture of, of how the machinery of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, actually functions with regard to the, to the professional staff and, and then those who are appointed. My question that I uh, asked, which may be answered in the next millennium uh, earlier, is I, I was interested in whether or not there is political in, in interference and number one, uh, is it the normal process that the professional staff, the experts, the scientists collect information, uh, make recommendations then to the uh, director, and then those recommendations are acted on? Is that the normal process? The, I'll, I can share with you how it used to work. Um, um, and as a, I was a long-time endangered species biologist before accepting the presidential appointment as director. Um, and it, during that time, uh, you are right in that uh, as director, I relied very heavily on the professional staff. They're highly competent, uh, incredibly dedicated, and, and very capable. And they would uh, conduct all the science and um, all the kind of analytics uh, they're closest to the ground, closest to the species, and and uh, certainly the the most knowledgeable about the scientific um, effects. Uh, they would make then make a rec recommendation that would be uh, moved through the regional office and into Washington. Um, uh, the responsibility of uh, uh, those of us in Washington were to review the science and ensure that it complied with the policy and statutory requirements of, in this case, the Endangered Species Act. Um, while certainly it was, uh, there's the opportunity for the policy makers uh, political appointees uh, to come up or to result with a different conclusion than the recommendation of the scientists and biologists. Um, uh, it was absolutely unheard of that the policymakers would change the underlying science. Congressman Cleaver, yes. I might elaborate um, a little bit. Over the past seven years, the Bush administration has essentially shut down the listing program for endangered species. This administration has listed fewer species than any administration in history, and it's not because of a lack of worthy candidates. Overall, there are 279 species that are official candidates that have been waiting an average of 19 years for protection. Secretary Kempthorne has gone 617 days without listing a single species under the Endangered Species Act. The second longest delay in history was in 1981, when then Secretary of the Interior James Watt went 382 days without listing a species. And in that situation, Congress quickly amended the act to include the strict statutory deadlines for listing species that we now have. We have repeatedly seen political appointees in this administration use delays, such as the current delay with the polar bear listing, to interfere with the conclusions of service biologists. One example from a similar situation concerns a species called the California tiger salamander. The service was under a court order to list a issue a final listing decision for this species and ask the court for more time. This time was then used by the political appointee to overrule the judgment of agency scientists, and the court later ruled that the request for a delay had been used to illegally reduce protection for that species. Under investigation by Congress and the Inspector General, the service has admitted to political interference in seven listing decisions, which involved uh, former Assistant Secretary, 
Secretary Julie McDonald, but has not actually committed to correcting this interference. And the Center for Biological Diversity has found evidence of political interference in additional 55 Endangered Species Act listing decisions that the agency has refused to address. And this is why we are so concerned with the current delay in the listing decision for the polar bear. I think there's unanimity, at least on this side, that we do need to, to act and that the uh, delay is uh, unfortunately politically, politically motivated. We have seen reports from staff bleached in other areas of, uh, of our government over the past few years, and so it, it will not be a shock uh, to see it happen here. Uh, Ms. Williams, my, my final question, how far can polar bears uh, swim? They can swim long distances. Uh, part of it depends on the conditions. But it is important to note that when polar bears swim, they use a lot of energy. They are really designed to swim from iceberg to iceberg or short distances where there is no ice. They are not designed to swim 500 miles, which some of the projections show the ice will be 500 miles offshore and polar bears will have the great challenge of swimming 500 miles from the edge of the ice to come on land to den. What we found, and it was actually MMS scientists that found, that you know, with uh, diminished ice uh, several years ago, there was a storm. And they have found more and more polar bears in the water as opposed to on ice, because there is less ice. And it was those MMS scientists that found the drowned polar bears. And polar bears were drowned after that storm because they didn't have enough ice to rest on and to seek refuge on. So polar bears can drown when they have too far to swim. They can use too much energy when they have too far to swim. It can affect their denning activities and other activities. So polar bears, again, were designed biologically to be on ice, not swimming on water except for short distances. So the more the ice retreats, the worse it is for polar bears. And of course, Polar bears swimming through oil, as we know from a study that was done by uh, Canadian scientists, is lethal. I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Emsley, but I, I, I was trying to make a point earlier, and perhaps uh, I didn't make it as, uh, as yes, I did. It was clear. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, when we talk about clean, uh, cleanup of an oil spill, we're not talking about uh, reversing uh, the uh, impact completely of that oil spill. Uh, and, and I was trying to point out that after the USS Arizona uh, uh, was, was damaged and, and, and went under, that 60 years later it's still right. leaking oil. You, if you went there today, you'd right. see oil bubbling up. Right. And Mr. Cleaver, if I may respond to that, one of my jobs when I was special assistant was to serve on the Exxon Valdez Trustee Council. And as you know, the Exxon Valdez oil spill occurred almost 19 years ago. There is still dramatic oil residues and release from that spill today. We also know from Exxon Valdez the spill cleanup process failed. And when you combine what we see from spills throughout the nation and the world and the failure of spill cleanup to begin with, the long residual life of oil spills, and when you combine that with the Chukchi Sea, which is the worst possible conditions for even trying to spill ice. Imagine that you just have this big tub filled with ice cubes and you pour oil in there. How are you going to get the oil out between the ice cubes? Various demonstration projects have been tried and they have failed in even under the best of circumstances to clean up that oil in those conditions. So we have a triple whammy condition in the Chukchi Sea. It could not be worse for polar bears with respect to spills. And we have established that the likelihood of a major oil spill is 33 to 51 percent. Thank you very kindly. Mr. Ensley. Uh, thank you. Before I forget, I enter into the record the environmental impact statement that I was referring to in my previous questions. Uh, this, this planned sequence of events to allow this leasing before this designation just makes me harken back. I'm real glad that we didn't allow DDT before we had the designation of the bald eagle. I saw four of them sitting on pilings at, outside where I lived the other day. And, and I think it's a, it would be a similar type of, of tragedy. So I appreciate your work being here. Um, I want to ask you about hunting issues. Uh, hunting of polar bears now is prohibited by the Marine Mammal 
Protection Act, but it's allowed for people to go out and hunt in Canada and bring them back as, as trophies. And I'm told there's some significant decline going, in, going on in the Hudson Bay polar bear population. If there is a designation, uh, how would it affect that loophole? Could the agency close that loophole or would it require statutory action? Thank you, Congressman Inslee. When a species is uh, listed as threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act, it is automatically designated as depleted under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And under normal circumstances, species that are designated as depleted under the Marine Mammal Protection Act are not uh, eligible for um, the approval of sport hunted trophies from Canada. So it is possible that if the polar bear is listed under the Endangered Species Act, that importation of sport hunted polar bear trophies from Canada will no longer be possible. I would note, however, that uh, Director Hall at the press conference last week when he announced the delay on the listing decision did also note that it might be possible to apply for an exemption from this process from the Marine Mammal Commission. And what is the science to date about the decline of the Hudson species, whether it's related to global warming or hunting or both or other, other reasons? Could you give us any uh, insight on that? Scientists have attributed the decline of the western Hudson Bay population to global warming and also to the harvest of approximately 40 bears each year from that population, which at some point during the decline of the species ceased to be sustainable. Great. Um, going back to this listing decision and how it affects the, the leasing, you know, we've talked a lot about the danger of oil spills and the 33 to 51 percent um, likelihood of, of a spill and the potential mortality. But there's another huge sort of uh, elephant in the room, if you will, and that's the CO2 associated with burning the oil that, that we drill. And that's really the ultimate, you know, potential mortality of the species of CO2 coming out of the oil we burn and we drill, going in the atmosphere, heating the atmosphere, melting the ice cap. By the way, somebody said it's only a 20 percent reduction. That's way, way off. That's uh, way off. I, could you explain why that is way off, Ms. Williams? Indeed, the 20 percent is incorrect. The reduction that we've experienced is 10 percent per year since the 1970s. And uh, essentially, the <coughs> minimum that we experienced last summer in 2007 was 23 percent less than the previous minimum, but it was essentially 40 percent less than the average between the 70s and currently. But it has been 10 percent per year since the 70s. And do I understand there is both a reduction in the area covered to the extent that in, in a very short period of time, either a decade or shortly thereafter, there will be no summer ice by area, but there is also about a 40 percent reduction on the average depth of the ice and That's pretty much across its range. That's correct, Mr. Inslee. And one thing that is useful, I think the committee members know, but perhaps for the public to understand better. Right now, the average depth of the Arctic ice cap is only three feet. Some people, if you walked up to an average person and said, how thick do you think the Arctic ice cap is over the North Pole, they'd probably say, what, 100 feet, 200 feet, right? It's only three feet. And that has diminished by 40 to 50 percent in the last several decades. And so we're talking about a very fragile habitat, ice that is on average only three feet thick. That's why global warming has had such a profound effect on it. So uh, if the polar bear is listed, would it be appropriate for in any leasing decision, including this one, to consider the CO2 emissions and their capability to further this acceleration and the decline of the Arctic sea ice? Right. Um, section 7, uh, the, the consultation provision that uh, the administration seemingly is trying to escape. Uh, but Section 7 would require the evaluation, the analysis of not only the direct and indirect effects of the proposed actions, but the interrelated and interdependent effects. Um, and so um, in that light, uh, there would be a much more comprehensive uh, review and analysis of the impacts to the, uh, of the threats affecting the polar bears than would ever occur under the Marine Mammal Protection Act or any uh, interagency conferencing under a proposed species listing. Very well. Um, our time has expired, and uh, I want to thank the witnesses, all of the witnesses, both panels. It's been very educational. Uh, we are, at least 
Many of us on this panel are hopeful that this will help inspire the administration and the Secretary to take another look at this issue, and I will be joining uh, Mr. Markey in introducing legislation today, uh, should that not take place by revisiting by the administration to do this by legislation or otherwise. And I've, of course, been joined by other two, two dozen of my colleagues in a letter to the Secretary uh, urging him to, to revisit this, what we believe to be a very ill-considered decision. With that, uh, having seized the gavel, we will consider this hearing concluded. Coming up on C-SPAN 3, a military briefing from Iraq with Lieutenant General Ray Odierno speaking to Pentagon reporters by satellite. We'll take you there live when that...